Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert spent more than two years, 804 days, in an Iranian prison, falsely accused of spying. It was during that time she met Nazanin Zakari Ratcliffe, who recently returned to the UK after a five-year sentence on similar charges. No victory is how she describes Nazanin's release because she had to serve her full term. Kylie reveals the details of her ordeal in a brilliant new memoir, The Uncaged Sky, and she joins me now. Uh, Kylie, thanks so much for coming on Times Radio. Before we talk about your period of imprisonment in Iran, can you just tell me a little bit about, about you before that period? You're an academic. I know you travelled to Iran to attend an academic conference, but just tell me yeah, you're Australian. Tell me just a little bit about your life pre that event? Yeah, so I was born in Australia, uh, but I have a British passport as well um, from ancestry. My father's British and uh, grew up a pretty regular Australian childhood, really. And um, when I graduated high school, I took myself off to the UK, as many Aussies before me have done, and uh, actually spent not just one gap year, but seven years living in Britain. I did my undergraduate degree there and uh, moved back to Australia to take up a PhD position at the University of Melbourne in uh, 20, end of 2013. And you studied um, um, Islamic cultures, didn't you? Yeah, I studied uh, Middle Eastern studies at Cambridge University um, in the UK and then continued on uh, that vein into my PhD. Uh, which I wrote about the Shia community of the Persian Gulf state of Bahrain. So that was to prove uh, quite important uh, when it came to your being interrogated in Iran. Tell us what happened. You, you went to Iran to attend um, an academic conference. Yeah, I was actually invited to Iran by an Iranian university, can you believe? Uh, so they asked me to come. And uh, it was a seminar on Shia Islam, which was relevant to the research I was doing into the Arab communities of the Persian Gulf, Arab Shia communities. So, you know, I jumped at the opportunity. I thought it would be great. I could learn a lot. I could do some useful networking with other academics because the seminar was for uh, European and Western scholars of Middle Eastern studies and Islamic studies. And um, my university back here supported it, paid for my flights, and I got my visa in advance from the Iranian embassy in Canberra before flying off to Iran. So as far as I was concerned, everything, all the boxes had been ticked and, you know, I should have been safe and, and had a, a fun trip and come home three weeks later. Did you have any worries at all? I mean, there have been previous cases of people being arrested on charges of spying and so on that have been pretty public. I mean, you know, not necessarily many, but but enough to 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 make traveling there at least have some degree of of worry attached to it. Actually, I, I hadn't really heard of the phenomenon of hostage diplomacy before that Iran takes innocent foreign citizens hostage in order to leverage them for concessions from Western countries. I had heard of the hostage crisis in the 19, 1979, the US embassy, but that to me felt, felt like so long ago, I didn't actually think that such a horrible ordeal could happen to somebody like me. I, I inquired of others who'd done research in Iran or who traveled to Iran and I was told, look, it's an authoritarian regime, it's pretty nasty, but then, name a Middle Eastern country which doesn't have an, a nasty authoritarian regime. And um, in contrast to some of its neighbours, it's pretty stable. There's no wars there. There's no terrorism there. It's It's got a strong central government. And from the perspective of a visitor or a traveller, it's pretty safe. So I just didn't expect that, you know, such a thing could, could be done to a person like me. And everything went very well. Uh, until I think a day or so before you were due to depart uh, when the receptionist at, at your hotel had a few warning words. Is that right? Yeah, it was the 24 hours before my flight and I'd been quite friendly with the receptionist. He was, like all Iranian people, so warm and hospitable and wanting to practice his English. And so I'd been chatting with him a little bit and so he pulled me aside and said, Kylie, my boss told me I'm not allowed to tell you this but I, I feel you should know. 
some men came to the hotel today and were asking about you and whether you were there and what your room number was and that they're very bad men but he wouldn't tell me who they were or what they wanted and then sort of later tried to put me at ease by telling me oh maybe they're the tourist police maybe it's nothing but for him to say that they were very bad men I think he knew that they were the revolutionary guards who were the group that eventually arrested me the next day at the airport and I just you know I was unsettled by that and I I never for a million years thought that they're going to put a flight ban on me and not let me leave the airport so I figured as long as I stay away and and these men don't catch up with me I'll go to the airport the next day I'll fly out and that's that so it, it, you know in retrospect I realized that I was in deep trouble at that moment and I should have gone straight to the embassy the British embassy or the Australian embassy but everybody was telling me oh no it's probably nothing and because I hadn't done anything wrong I just I had no concept that such a thing could happen to me what happened at the airport has the quality of a, of a film script because you can't imagine that, that that something that that terrifying would happen in real life. You'd already checked in. You were already on your way. Tell us what happened next. Yeah, so I checked in, got my boarding pass and was walking toward passport control and a group of plainclothes men approached me. They didn't identify themselves. They didn't show me any badge or any official license or anything so I had no idea who they were and they didn't look like police and they brandished this very dodgy looking printout just with farsi lettering uh, from a home computer probably from a home printer and told me that this was my arrest warrant and it didn't look like an official document and I had no idea who these guys were so I was terrified and I thought, gosh, is this some sort of gang or something? Like, I, I didn't expect them to be an arm of the state. And in a way, they're not. The, the Revolutionary Guards are a kind of a state within a state in Iran. And they sort of operate externally, aside from the government. And the government has a rival intelligence organisation that also arrests innocent people. So um, they're kind of in competition with one another. But I had no idea who these people were and they manoeuvred me away from passport control into an interrogation room in the airport. I missed my flight. They were telling me at that moment, if you cooperate with us, we'll put you on another flight and we'll send you back home. And, and, you know, and what I, were they accusing you of? Mm. Um, at that moment, they weren't accusing me of anything. I think they didn't know what they wanted from me. And it was a kind of a shakedown. They were trying to frighten me and get me to tell them more about myself, from which they could then concoct a narrative around what they would accuse me of doing. They wanted the passwords to my computer, to my emails, my phone, and were going through all of my documents and um, my online uh, information as well to try to craft this narrative so you know they unfortunately I since realized that the Iranians engage in this sort of dodgy practice all the time and either you're a spy in which that's of great benefit to them because well they can get information out of you and I, honestly they're so incompetent and amateur that I very much doubt that they actually catch any bona fide spies but most likely you're not a spy but you're still a foreigner who's got into trouble and they can then use you as a valuable bargaining chip and leverage that to get something from your country so either way they win it's a win-win situation and they're not particularly bothered by what you've done or not done per se it's what price they can get for you that matters but at the time you were just a scared person trying to make it home and finding yourself in this nightmare scenario, being interrogated first in the airport, I think, for 24 hours, something like that. And then they, they took you to a hotel, but where you were also incarcerated and, and not allowed to leave. And the interrogations continued. Um, at, during which at all of that time you must have been thinking this is going to end soon I mean this is this is a crazy thing that's going on but 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 any minute now they're going to put me on a plane home when did you realize that that was not what was going to happen I think I knew deep in the pit of my stomach that I was in deep trouble 
and that they were lying to me when they were telling me they would put me on a plane home. But my brain just couldn't compute. I was in a state of shock and I just latched onto the idea that I would be going home and that it would come to an end soon rather than allow myself to believe that maybe that wouldn't happen. And I was in denial. So I think I knew that my situation was much more complicated than what they were letting on, but I just was in such a state of anguish and anxiety and fear and shock that I wasn't able to process or comprehend what that meant. So it took a really long time for it to sink in. Even when they'd sent me to Evan prison and thrown me in solitary confinement, I still thought at some point they're going to realise I'm innocent. This is a colossal misunderstanding. Either the British government, the Australian government will get me out or, you know, they'll be done with the questions and they'll they'll free me because they'll know that I'm innocent and I've done nothing wrong. It took a really, really long time for me to educate myself, largely from other prisoners telling me about this hostage-taking business model of the Revolutionary Guards for me to properly understand the, the nature of the situation I found myself in. You had a sort of team of interrogators almost on shift work, uh, you know, some of whom became familiar faces. What support did you have, if any? I mean, I don't know, embassy officials or a lawyer or, I mean, what contact did you have with the outside world, you know, in that first period? Oh, none whatsoever. Uh, I was denied consular assistance until the interrogation phase was over. I wasn't allowed to have a lawyer or appoint a lawyer until two weeks before my trial, nine months after my arrest. And even once he was appointed, I wasn't allowed to meet with him to discuss my case. So he was entirely pointless and useless. Uh, I had sporadic calls to family at the very beginning, uh, but I wasn't allowed to tell them anything about what was going on, where I was, the interrogation, nothing. So I was completely cut off from the outside world during those um, initial few months of interrogation. You mentioned um, uh, solitary confinement. And as I understand it, you spent the first year of, of your time in prison in solitary confinement. Can you describe the circumstances you found yourself in? I I didn't spend the first year. I spent cumulatively 12 months in solitary. Uh, The longest stretch in one go was seven months. Uh, And that was from in throughout 2020. Uh, So toward the end of my incarceration, I spent maybe four months straight up at the beginning alone before getting my first cellmate. Uh, So it was sort of on again, off again, solitary for periods and stints I would be alone and then I would have a cellmate and at the end I was moved to a public prison for three months where I literally lived and went from being in solitary to living amongst a hundred women in a cell which was quite something to grapple with psychologically. Uh, You say that that was difficult to grapple with psychologically but I think for a lot of people listening the idea of being in solitary confinement is even more uh, intimidating and and you know we're talking about extremely spartan circumstances can you describe the cell you found yourself in and you know, I mean, it's it's really unthinkable when I when I was reading this story and, you know, you try and put yourself in, in, in the situation you found yourself in and it's almost impossible to imagine it if you haven't lived through it. It is. I actually had no idea that when they opened that door and pushed me inside, that tiny cubicle, a two and a half by two and a half metre box, would be the place that I would sleep in and inhabit for 23 hours a day, every day for a month. I actually thought it was a a cubicle for changing my clothes and changing into the prison uniform and that I would take off my my regular clothes, put the uniform on, and then they'd take me out again and put me in the actual cell I was supposed to live in. So I, I just, it took a while for me to understand that I have to sleep here. There was literally nothing. There was not even a bed, no furniture, no mattress, no pillow, uh, no window, no natural light, just LED lights on 24 hours a day, nothing whatsoever to do to occupy your mind. You just sit there and you stare at the wall in front of you for hours and hours each day and you try to come up with a way of entertaining yourself. 
it is psychological torture and it is designed deliberately to break you for the interrogation. And it works because, you know, you go crazy in there. And you, I know that you, you would look at the wall and try and look for messages there. There were some messages there. In fact, one day there was, there was quite an in, in encouraging message there. But, you know, how did you manage to deal with the, the mental pressure? Because when you weren't in there staring at the walls, you were being interrogated. Yeah, I actually preferred going to the interrogations than being alone in my own head in solitary confinement. You become your own torturer and they don't need to torture you, you torture yourself in solitary. So whenever they would come and bring me to interrogation, I would feel in a weird sense relief that I wasn't alone and I'd be able to speak and have a conversation with somebody, even though those conversations were obviously hostile and unfriendly and scary it still felt more normal than being in solitary um and I at the beginning I didn't cope I was a mess I was a wreck I was crying I was hurting uh, I was full of regret and anguish and rumination and you know I should have done this differently I should have done that differently it's all my fault what what must my family be feeling you know I, I really was in a terribly dark place but after a couple of weeks I think my brain just exhausted itself and I started to adapt to being in solitary and I started to take a less cooperative approach to the interrogations too and started to resist and push back and not cooperate so much with them. And um, both those shifts for me helped me survive better in there. Kylie, you've just been describing there um, how, you know, the interrogations actually were a relief from the, the time in solitary confinement, but that after a couple of weeks, you, you found that kind of cooperating less and, and the busyness of your brain dying down proved to be really strong supports for you in the jail. In, where did you find the strength? Where did you find the strength to, to battle back? Because you didn't even end up signing a confession as so many others who've been in that situation have ended up doing. And, and that must take incredible resilience. And, and I mean, what, 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 was, what was driving you? I was very angry. And I think at the beginning, I drew strength from my anger. I was furious and enraged that they had lied to me so much uh, in the lead up to my being thrown in prison and that horrible things were being done to me, an innocent person who had done nothing to deserve it. You know, I knew my human rights were being violated. I knew that what they were doing to me was torture. And, you know, I turned that anger into strength in a way. I decided to stop cooperating with them and to start resisting because I was furious and I just felt, well, cooperating has got me nowhere. What has it done to me? They just lie and they trick and they cheat and they do whatever they want anyway. And it's a foregone conclusion anyway. I could see the entire thing was a farce and they weren't interested in whether I was innocent or guilty. They knew I was innocent. They knew I wasn't a spy, but they were going to craft that narrative anyway because it served their interests. And I thought, well, I may as well retain some shred of dignity and integrity and resist and fight back because, A, it's something to do, but, B, they'd already taken everything away from me. I had nothing to lose. I'd stopped caring about myself and my own welfare long ago. Psychological torture in, in solitary confinement, you know, it, it does that to you. You just efface all of yourself and dehumanise yourself and are dehumanized by others. So I, I thought, well, I may as well fight back and resist because at least I have my dignity if I do that. You say you were angry, but were you also still frightened? And, and were you threatened? Were you threatened with sexual violence, physical violence? Were you tortured? Or, or, or was it really of the mental variety? I was certainly threatened, but I was. it was... I was beaten up once um, a good year, one year, one year and a half, maybe after my arrest uh, by a male and a female prison guard. And that was a horrendous experience. And, you know, they injected me with uh, a tranquilizing 
substance um, with a syringe against my will as well and this kind of thing which was quite um, trauma traumatic for me but I was certainly threatened with physical violence I was threatened with what could be seen to be torture but I was also threatened with the death penalty as well but um, mostly it was just threats and I understood that as a foreigner I am a value to them in one piece whole and as a, a useful bargaining chip I'm not of any value to them as a pulverized mess or as an executed body or whatever so I didn't necessarily believe some of those threats I was afraid of sexual violence particularly at the beginning there was always a lot of men a big gaggle of men and I was often blindfolded and handcuffed so I was afraid that they would do something to me but after the fact that they didn't on a number of occasions, I, I understood that that was unlikely and started to, you know, and at that point I didn't care. After a few months in there, I stopped caring about my own welfare. I was, you know, so apathetic that I was willing to do anything and risk anything to resist because I honestly I felt I had nothing to lose and I didn't care what they did to me in punishment. Did you... I mean, you talk about resisting and not cooperating and, and not caring. Did that take itself as far as you not caring whether you lived or died, feeling that, 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 that you know, it didn't matter anymore? I had very dark moments where if I could have ended things, I would have. But mostly I did want to live. I didn't lose my passion for life. And my, you know, I, I had a sense that my life, I was only 31 when I was arrested. My life isn't meant to be over now. I want to keep living and I want to fight for that life so I can get that life back. And I wasn't always alone. I had some friends that I made in the prison initially via uh, sort of an illicit secret note passing network that we'd established with a couple of other cells and talking through an air conditioning vent on certain lax of guard shifts. And these women gave me hope. They gave me solidarity. They gave me friendship. And they gave me important insights into what was going on in the prison and what would likely happen with me in my case. And this really helped me find the inner strength to keep going and the hope that I, I still can get that life back. So most of the time I didn't despair and give up. I, I did, you know, strive and, and, you know, didn't give in to those darker emotions. And when you were finally able to be in contact uh, with your family, um, you know, erratic though that contact was and, and, you know, very much dependent on, you know, um, you know permission, as it were, um, I think, the other particularly affecting story in here is how little support you got from your husband at the time. And, you know, to add that onto the list of torturous things you were enduring must have been incredibly hard emotionally, as if you hadn't suffered enough already. Yeah, I kind of pushed those feelings to one side when I was in prison. I knew that all was not right with my ex-husband. And by the final year of my incarceration, I sensed that we were over. But the outside world felt like a dream. I disconnected myself so wholly and completely from my former life as a survival mechanism to protect myself that I just put it to one side and said, if and when I come home, I'll deal with it. So... It was harder for me to adjust to that coming out of prison than it actually was when I was still inside. In the aftermath of the release of Nazanin, Zagari Ratcliffe, there was um, a lot of, uh, you know, box standing from politicians and so on, talking about um, the fact that, you know, it was the British government that had managed to get her out. And and indeed, we had one minister on, on, on Times Radio sort of saying that, that it was actually um, detrimental for families to make a fuss. But I know that all the time you were in jail, you were desperate for people to make a fuss, to, to, to raise 
uh, your case to to make sure that it was on public consciousness. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit about you know what you learned about how to deal with a situation like that. I was demanding that my situation be made public because sunlight is the best disinfectant. And if you shine a spotlight on such egregious violations of human rights, international law, the concept and the principle of justice that the Iranians are perpetrating against their own people and against foreigners on a daily basis, then that can only be good for those people who are very vulnerable and like me living entirely at the mercy of a group that has been classified as a terrorist organization by the United States, an extreme Islamist group, mafia gang, really. And, you know, there are different ways of engaging with the media. I think personally that governments need to, and diplomats especially, need to get into the 21st century and understand that not all media is bad or detrimental. Media can be used strategically to assist various diplomatic objectives when you're trying to free uh, an arbitrarily detained person. And I think this blanket approach of all governments that all governments seem to take of quiet diplomacy, um, the British government definitely was pushing that line with all of the British hostages, as was the Australian government, uh, as is the US, everybody. I think that's illogical. My family was told, and I know that Richard Radcliffe was told, and the Ashuri family was told as well, for Anusha Ashuri, that if you go public, your loved one will be harmed in prison. And that's completely irrational, because where's the evidence that that's ever happened? And why would the IRGC or the Iranian government punish a prisoner because media in a foreign country, entirely independent of that person, has published their case, the fact that they've been arrested. I, there's been no precedent of that. The Iranians have never punished somebody because media has covered their case. There are all manner of different political prisoners and hostages in Iranian prisons. Many of them are very well known and many of them are, are famous women, women's rights or human rights activists from Iran, like Nasrin Sutudeh, for example, or Narges Mohammadi, their names are known in other parts of the world. They're, they're internationally recognized and they're in the media and they've never been punished for that, let alone a foreign citizen. So I just don't think it's rational. I think it's convenient for governments to run that line because it means there's less of an interest in what they're doing, less media breathing down their necks asking, what have you done or haven't you done maybe to get this person out? What representations have you made to that government? How are you interacting with the family? Difficult questions aren't asked if that person's situation is a secret. And so it suits governments to have this quiet diplomacy approach. But I'm not convinced that it's in the interests of the hostage or the arbitrarily detained person. And in my case, being someone educated on the inside, I wanted the somebody to give me the, the, the basic dignity of being able to decide about my own fate and make that call for myself. And I was asking my family and representatives of the embassy, please make my situation public. And they didn't give me that agency to decide for myself about what was, what was best for me. And that was very, very frustrating. And I'm convinced that quiet diplomacy isn't necessarily what got me out. It's the combination of a public campaign and the pressure that that put on my own government, as well as on the Iranians, to release me in combination with the diplomatic negotiations. You mentioned how during these over two years, you made some good friends. I think you met Nazanin while, while you were in jail, but, but your book is dedicated to two other women still in jail there. And I know that a, a fellow prisoner in Evin, uh, an Iranian Australian recently died in prison there. I mean, how much do you have hope for the situation changing? And, 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 and what's the, the toll from your experience that you're going to carry with you? I don't have much hope in the short term that anything is going to change. I think the international community needs to do much, much more to put paid to Iran's 
addictive habit of hostage taking of foreigners and dual nationals. We're doing nothing to disincentivize that right now. All we're doing is incentivizing it further and they've never really paid a price for that. Uh, for the Iranian people, the many hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of innocent Iranians who have been thrown into these deplorable conditions in prison, simply for using their right to free speech or for speaking out or for protesting on the streets because of the cost of living or various other innocuous things. You know, these people are really, really suffering. There are very few outside of Iran who've heard of them, who can be a voice for them. And there's not enough attention being paid on Iran's human rights record. I'm not hopeful for the short term future. I think whilst this regime remains in power in Iran, nothing is going to change. We'll just see more of the same. And, you know, Britain, America, Germany, various countries are negotiating with Iran right now over a new JCPOA nuclear deal. And it saddens me that human rights are not at all of interest to these negotiations. It's all about let's replace the Russian oil that's left the market due to sanctions with Iranian oil. Now, in my mind, in terms of violations of, of human rights and the deplorable nature of those regimes, there's very little difference between the two. And what, you know, what, why don't we think about the human rights of the Iranian people when negotiating such deals? Just finally, Kylie, your book is full of remarkable detail. I, I dare say you didn't have a lot else to think about at the time, so it stayed embedded uh, in your memory. But I wondered what the memory is that you wish you could erase. Gosh, there are several of them, and not all of them are detailed in the book necessarily. I have some really, really tough memories of normally times that I spent in solitary that I actually felt so despairing of my situation that I, I couldn't move my limbs. I, I, I felt I fell into such a deep and dark place and such a well of despair that my brain was sending messages to my legs and my arms to move and they wouldn't move. I felt paralyzed within my own body. And I understand why people say that grief and despair is paralyzing because I actually felt physically incapable of movement. I was that sad and depressed and down and, and despairing. And I don't like to revisit those moments, but I would say that that's a dark place that I would love to forget exists and hope that I never go back to for the rest of my life. Dr. Kylie Moore-Gilbert, thank you so much for joining us and, and telling us your story. The Uncaged Sky, published by Ultimo Press, is out now.